July 5th, 2008. With a forecasted high of 105 degrees and not a cloud in sight, that sunny Saturday in July was bound to be a scorcher. But, you know, we didn't care. It was going to be the greatest day in our lives. It was the day that Kyle and Lisa stood at the front of an unair conditioned church, by the way, to recite our wedding vows. We walked down the aisle. There were songs. There was singing. We said our I do's. We kissed. The crowd cheered. We ate. We had cake. We danced. We said goodbye to our guests. We headed to a hotel. We won't talk about the rest of the evening except to say that it went well. My wife's groaning at home somewhere. That day, two single people became one forever. And all these years later, you know, I still look back at those two young kids who had so much passion for each other. And I think, man, they had no idea what was coming their way. I see two individuals who had a shared life vision who would need to go through some rough patches to learn what it meant to be a couple together. See, oneness doesn't come easily. Everybody hears that before the altar, but we really don't grasp it until we get married for ourselves. And that's a good thing, by the way. You know, purity of mind in the young is something that should be protected, isn't it? It's the reason that no good parent introduces their children to the difficulties of life too soon. We know that they're going to figure it out eventually on their own anyway. And so the same thing is true for a young marriage. Soon enough, they will figure out that hopes and dreams before the altar can often turn into expectations and disappointments after. And ultimately, it's how a couple addresses those letdowns and those disappointments that determines both the quality of their marriage and whether they make it or not. But on a wedding day, you know, nobody wants to talk about any of that stuff, let alone think about it. Uh, We just want it to be about love that day. And today we are coming to one of the most famous sections of for sure the entire Old Testament, arguably one of them in all of the Bible as well, the Ten Commandments. Commandments. Uh, you know, on the one hand, there is such widespread familiarity with the Ten Commandments. Even atheists would say that they're familiar with them. On the other hand, and you can participate here at home or whether you're here in the house, how many of you could actually recite them? Show of hands. Okay, I got a couple here. I figured there'd be a couple like Sunday school you learn with something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me personally, I could mention one or two and then I'd be like, dun, 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 and it would kind of trail off a little bit. Now, I would prefer to think of the Ten Commandments today as God's wedding vows to Israel. And so my message title today is God's Wedding Vows. Now, the difference between a human wedding ceremony and this one is that God always comes through on his promises. You see, we're the ones who break them. And so this faithful, covenant-keeping God was outlining what relationship with God was supposed to look like between God and his people in Exodus 20. It wouldn't just be what relationship would look like for these particular people people of that time. See, these implications would carry weight for thousands of years until Christ would come and fulfill them. And we'll talk a little bit about how Christ fulfilled them in a bit. But in my Easter message last Sunday, I alluded to the fact that the Jewish law has been unnecessarily given a bad rap in many different Christian circles. Um, and, and it's kind of been viewed as something that has a little bit more of a negative connotation rather than a positive one. And nothing could be further from the truth. You know, yes, the law was was incomplete, 100%. And we are no longer under that covenant, 100%. We're under the covenant of Christ. And we know that, or Jesus wouldn't have needed to come and fulfill that covenant. Having said that, the law was God's covenant relationship with his people, Israel, for thousands of years. And so we're going to look at what it meant for them then. And we're going to take a peek for what it means for us today. So open a Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus is the second book in your Bible, so it's pretty easy to find. You can download that YouVersion app if you have not yet uh, fired it up there on your phone, and you can follow along that way. And we're going to see a picture here 
of Moses on a mountaintop with God. He's wrapped in smoke, in thunder, in fire, which is why we use the hazing machine in the church. Uh, just putting that up. I'm kidding. That's not why. It just looks cool. Uh, but it's, there's thunder, there's the smoke, there's fire, there's mystery, there's fear. And no doubt all of that was a part of the image. And even though I'm calling this a wedding today, it wasn't all roses and sweet songs. And if you went to that wedding, you would have thought it was the weirdest wedding ever, okay? Um, in fact, the people were rightly terrified of God in this entire story. Some people think that all we need to respond to God in obedience is to remind ourselves of his love and his goodness. Now, certainly it is true that we know in the Bible, it says it is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And that is an amazing point to remind ourselves of the goodness of God and his love. But it is never enough to keep us walking obediently with God all the time. See, we also need a little healthy fear of the Lord to keep us obeying God. And God in this passage was literally trying to scare the H-E double hockey sticks out of the Israelites. Make no mistake, that's what the picture was on this mountain. And at the same time, it was also this loving ceremony between the Lord and his people where God was committing himself to them. And God was outlining the terms of the, for the relationship. And one of the things we've talked about in this Exodus series has been the fact that there has always been if-then statements that are a part of our relationship with God. Israel's relationship with God had them. Our relationship with God has them. Okay, so having set that kind of uh, framework to build upon today, let's read Exodus 20 verses 1 through 21. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are a covenant-keeping God, that we can take you to the bank on every promise in your word. Lord, we thank you that even when we stray from you, you outline what we need to do to be made right with you and to stay in relationship, to be restored. You are such a good, good God to us. We pray today that you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see from your word, that you'd open our ears, that we'd hear what you want us to hear, and most importantly, God, would you open our hearts today that we would respond and become the disciples Jesus wants us to be as a result of having spent time in your word and together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Exodus 20, and we're gonna read verses one through 21. It says, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers uh, on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. (laughs) And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So you see this whole image where there's this combination of God speaking and the people are afraid because they don't want to get too close to God. Well, we see this whole thing starts off in verses one through two, one and two, Uh, with the foundation of it being grounded in God's character, who he is, his commitment to his people, his past work, what he had done for them, and most importantly, his love for them. And God reminded them of all that he had done for them before they came into the land. He's like, hey, remember me? I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, your deliverer. Now, of course, they hadn't forgotten 
But the reality is God knows, he knew their, prope- their prophetic propensity to forget. And in the same way in our lives, the Lord knows prophetically our propensity to forget as well. So he's reminding them of everything that he had done for them. And as long as the Israelites kept this covenant, the Israelites would be greatly blessed as a people, they would multiply greatly. Now in light of the new covenant established by Christ, I don't see the promise of prosperity in exchange for obedience as a direct one-to-one connection uh, relevant to every single Christian today. In fact, Christians aren't under the law of Moses at all. I'm I'm gonna get to that, what that means for us today. However, the principle that God loves us, that he longs to provide for us, and even to bless us as his people, that remains as relevant as ever. So we're gonna work from that understanding. And I'm going to do my best to talk through the implications of the Ten Commandments as a whole for Christians today. Now, I thought about doing a little mini-series within Exodus where we go through each one of the Ten Commandments, but then I realized, you know, we've already been in Exodus for like ever, and so we'd be in Exodus till the Lord comes back. Uh, And so I'm like, you know, let's do something. No, that's actually not why. The real reason I chose to do the whole thing together is because I really do believe the Ten Commandments are best understood as a whole. So what I've done is I've outlined for you three things, three things every Christian needs to know about the Ten Commandments, and then two things every Christian needs to know about the law as a whole. And so the first thing that's on your note sheet that you should have gotten when you come in, it's gonna flash on the bottom if you're there at home, is this. God wants to be number one everywhere. You know, all the commandments really get to this fact, but uh, verses one through three really hammer it home. God says, you should have no other gods before me. The nations around them were polytheistic and God didn't want to be just another one of the pantheon of gods that got added to their mix because that was what happened in the culture in that time. When they found out a new nation had a new God, they'd just be like, oh, let's just throw them in the thing. And you know, if if this is important to them, we'll put them in there. And God's like, no, I don't want to be in the pantheon. I want to be number one. I want to stand alone as the only God of the Israelites. It set them apart. Now it also showed them that only God was worthy of the praise of his people. And then God said, you shall have no carved images. Now there are two parts to this that are important to talk about. And the first part is that God didn't want the Israelites worshiping the false statues of the false gods uh, of the nations that were all around them. It was a little bit of an extension of the first commandment in that aspect, if you will. But the second part of it is God also didn't want the Israelites creating uh, an image of God, Yahweh, like they would in just a few weeks, we're gonna see in the golden calf, and God didn't want them to worship that false image that they made of him. Now, many people over the years of faith have taken this to mean that no artistic expressions of God should be made whatsoever uh, in light of this. Now, I don't think that's the case, especially in light of the new covenant that we live under today, but I also don't think that was the case for the Israelites then. God just didn't want them to make an image and then bow down and worship it. (laughs) That was the whole point. He wasn't saying that no images could ever be created. Now, there's also a phrase in there that idolaters would be punished to the third and the fourth generation. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems just a little bit harsh to me. Anybody else feel that way when you read the Bible? Like, you know, I I didn't even know my great grandpa and I'm on the hook for his sin for some reason. I mean, come on, that just doesn't seem fair. Uh, Well, a couple of things about this. First off, uh, the wrath of God has been upon every person from birth because we are born into the fallen world. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that eventually we all make the choice to sin all by ourselves without great grandpa or great grandma, right? We figure out how to go away from God all on their own. And there has only ever been one person who has ever lived a sinless life, Jesus Christ. And so the whole point of the covenant was to restore the Israelites in relationship with God when they would fall out of it. And so long as they would follow the covenant, they had a path to be restored and to be made right with God. So God was not being harsh here. He was just making the point that God wants to be number one everywhere. God also said, no taking God's name in vain. 
And the very secret name of God that Moses was referring to is what we often call Yahweh. Uh, now, the way that the Israelites would write it back then is they would often take the vowels out and just spell it out, Y-H-W-H. And they would do that so as not to take the name of the Lord in vain. And now, in fact, Jews today often simply referred to God as Hashem, which means the name. So again, they're so hardcore in not wanting to take the name of the Lord in vain that they don't even mention the version of the word without walls which or without vowels which was supposed to be a protection so they make a wall here so they don't go there then they make another wall here so they don't cross that boundary and and so here's the thing though you can put a million safeguards in place and try to keep stepping back and back and back and you can still take the name of the Lord your God in vain you can still use God's name flippantly or without the right honor or without the right perspective now for us today I think this means that we do need to watch our words when it comes to how we speak about God uh, or even think about God's name or talk about God's work in our lives to other people. I, I also think that it doesn't mean that you're going to hell if you've ever said, oh my. <laughs> how many of you, show of hands, moment of honesty in church, you said it and then you were worried lightning bolts were heading your way? I'll be honest, I have many, many times in my own life, okay? I think there's grace for everything, and especially how we speak about God, though. We do need to be mindful how we refer to, uh, to the Lord. But the whole point of this whole section is God wants to be number one everywhere. And when God isn't number one, everything else will feel off. You know, when we don't set God first, we think that we're setting uh, ourselves up for something better. But what's really happening is we're setting something or someone else first. And that something or someone else is usually ourselves. It's usually our own desires and our own needs. Um, and, and in reality, when we do that, what's really happening is that everything is going to feel just a little bit off kilter. Putting God first is a little bit like the top button on your shirt. If it is not lined up, the rest of the buttons are going to be off no matter how hard you try. Now, what I was going to do today for the beginning of the message was to literally have my buttons off for, from the intro to the message all the way until right now, driving 78.9% of you insane. But my metrosexual self just couldn't bring myself to do it. I, I just could not get to it. And so you can imagine it and you get the point. And the point is this, when God isn't first in our lives, everything else is going to be out of whack. And so we think we're giving ourselves a little break, a little more freedom in life. But what is really happening is that we are building a life that is off kilter, that's off foundation. And slowly but surely, things become more and more unsteady. God wants to be number one everywhere. The second thing that every Christian needs to know about the Ten Commandments is this. The Sabbath is the only commandment that is not repeated in the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? It's the only one. But rest is still a really big deal to God, and I'll talk more about this in just a minute. So commandment number four is the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was codified in law here, uh, but it had been present from the dawn of time within God's people. Now we see this because God made the world in six days in the beginning of Genesis, and on the seventh day he rested. God didn't rest because he was tired. God rested to set up a model for you and I to follow. And this commandment uh, and the next one, by the way, after it are the only two that are phrased in a positive sense of something that God wants us to do uh, as opposed to don't do this. So here's the, the thing. The Sabbath was a big deal to God then and rest is a big deal to God for us today. But the question I ask us today, are Christians today called to observe the Sabbath. Uh, I would say that not the way that the Jews did, but absolutely that rest is a big deal to God. God wants us to have a day off. And the question isn't, do we have to Sabbath? But the question is, what should spiritual rest look like for every Christian? You know, for the Jews, the Shabbat starts Saturday night and it goes all the way up till, I'm sorry, it starts Friday night and it goes all the way up till Saturday night when the stars come out. And that's the time for them to just be a solid day of rest and worship. Uh, but just based on practice alone, we know that Christians today are not bound to the strict Jewish observance of the Sabbath. Uh, and here's why. Early Christians began worshiping in the synagogues on what day? Help me out. 
Sunday. And they did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. But secondly, and practically speaking, the Jews were all using the buildings on Saturday. And so on Sunday, nobody was in there. And so they had a venue that they could use to to use for religious purposes or for Christian purposes. So here's the reality. Uh, Practically speaking, the earliest Christians moved the Sabbath practice for Christians to be Sunday. And many Christians opt for Sunday to be kind of like a Sabbath kind of a day. But really, though, the New Testament doesn't actually specify that it has to be that particular day. A Sabbath is simply a day of rest and worship. It's not just rest. It's not just Netflix and chill. That's what I want to do if it's just about meeting Kyle's uh, needs. It's rest and and worship. They have to be together or it doesn't meet the biblical grounds of a Sabbath. Now, what I like to say for Christians today uh, who are pondering what the Sabbath means for them is that we should all seek to find our own Sabbath and keep it. Now, ideally, the goal should be for a day, but if you can't make it happen for a whole day, make something happen in a day, okay? That's what we see. And if you're in an absolutely just insane season of your life, carve out what you can for rest and for worship. I think that it should be weekly, it should be regular, and it should be something that we treat as holy. And a part of all of our Sabbath should involve worship wherever we are. And this isn't in the Bible, but I probably think, you know, putting away the devices is probably helpful for this, and and I'm guilty of it myself, struggling to put it down, as I'm sure many of you are as well. I'm trying to do this more regularly in my life. So I would say to all of us today, find your Sabbath, and keep it. And that extra phrase in the Ten Commandments where uh, it says to keep the Sabbath holy, it implies that there's a regularity to it that's implied and also that there's something about the nature of it, that it's time that's supposed to be set apart because that's what that word holy means. It's a time that's set apart. Um, And so God wants us to find our Sabbath and to keep keep it. Here's the third thing that every Christian needs to know about the Ten Commandments. Believers are called to obedience as a life journey with God, not as a yardstick to measure our righteousness compared to other people. You know, all God has ever wanted from his people in response to our salvation uh, was, is a life of worship and obedience. And all the law and all the commandments point to this fact. Now, commandments six through 10 deal with certain aspects of living a holy and an obedient life. Now, they're a little bit like bare minimum-ish, in my opinion. Uh, here's what I mean by that. It's like, don't murder. Okay, that's a pretty low bar, I hope, for most of us that are in here today. Uh, the next one's like, don't commit adultery. All right, a little bit of a higher bar. Uh, The next one says, don't steal. Okay, guilty of that once as a kid. Still feel guilty about it, confessing it to you today. I'm not gonna lie. Um, Okay, then the next one's like, you know, be truthful in every situation. All right, now that's an even higher bar still. But, you know, these weren't meant to be the end all be all for how the Jews were supposed to live their life for all time. Uh, These were the building blocks from which everything else in their faith and in their life was built. Now on to the problem. You know, the law was never meant to be a ladder that the Jews used to climb their way to salvation. See, no matter how hard the Israelites tried, they could never and they would never earn their salvation to God. Neither will we, by the way. Uh, And so the law of Moses was always meant instead to be a yardstick that told God's people, without God, you never measure up. Let me illustrate it to you this way. You know, before COVID hit, uh, Lisa and I love to take the kids on the weekly, at least, trip to Disneyland. Yes, it's the second week in a row with an illustration about Disneyland. It's probably the 85th week in a row with an illustration about Disneyland. And that's all right, because I love it that much. Um, But every time we went, I would take Nigel over to what I call the big kid cars ride to see if he measured up to go on the ride. Um, And and that's my favorite ride in both parks, by the way. I absolutely love it. And pre-COVID, he never made it. I think he's going to make the cut when it reopens, but we'll get to that. Um, So how many of you, show of hands or at home, you can participate as well. How many of you remember going to an amusement park as a kid only to learn that a ride that you wanted to go on, you, you weren't tall enough to get there? See, 
I was always a shorty, okay? And like even up to junior high, I remember the Viper in Magic Mountain. Is it still there, by the way, people who go? Okay, and I always wanted to go on it and, and then I never did. And when I went on it, I felt miserable the whole day. And I'm like, I'm never doing it again. I don't know why I wanted to get on it. Anyway, another sidebar, getting off topic. You know what I would do? I would wear bigger shoes. I would spike my hair a little bit, whatever I could do. Uh, because there was that sign that said, if you're not this tall, you don't measure up. And anyone under this line can't go on this ride. Well, here's the thing. That is essentially what the Jewish law's whole purpose was. It was supposed to remind us, you don't measure up to God's holy standards. <laughs> and it was way up here. And, and, and they saw it and it's like, you're, never, you're not going to get in. You're not going to make it. You need a saving that is apart from your own righteousness. And in the case of the Old Testament, it was regular sacrifices that were made. And in our case, it's the once and for all sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sin. But here's what the Jews did then and what we often still do today. We removed this part at the top of the sign that says you must be this tall to get to heaven. And then instead we went and we backed ourselves up against the yardstick. We measured it and we went, wow, look how tall I am. (laughs) And then we go around looking for shorter people. (laughs) And we try to look at how other people compare to, to where we are instead of just reminding ourselves the whole point of the law is to say that no one is righteous. No, not even one. No one is eligible to get to heaven without God. And we're constantly, even today, trying to reconstruct salvation by works. Now, don't get me wrong. We're absolutely called to obedience 100%. But the point of the law has never been to show other people how obedient we are. The point was that we would remember and remind ourselves that only God could save us. And from that would come our realization of the power of our obedience, that we're called to obedience as a life journey with God, not as a yardstick that we use to measure our righteousness compared to other people. Now, here's where these get even more interesting. See, Jesus tells us he reinterpreted the Jewish law through the lens of fulfillment. And whenever I read the Ten Commandments, I read them specifically with Matthew chapter 5 in mind, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And Christ specifically spelled out in Matthew 5 how he fulfilled several aspects of the law. You know, the Ten Commandments are actually the first of 613 total commands that God gave to Moses in Exodus. Now remember again, the Bible wasn't broken up into nice chapters and verses uh, and divisions and, you know, even the little summaries that we have in our Bible of what the passage ahead is supposed to mean. Those are really helpful but they are not scripture. In reality, the 10 commandments as part of the Jewish law are just connected to the entire thing as a whole and Christians are not bound by the Jewish law. Even Jesus understood that it was 613 commands, it wasn't just 10. Let me show you how we know it. Turn now in the Bible to the book of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament. And go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 19, and we're gonna look at verses 16 through 19. If you know the story, it's the story of the rich young ruler. It's this guy who comes to Jesus, and he's trying to figure out what he's gotta do to go to heaven, and he walks away sad because he has too many possessions, and his money was his God, and he didn't wanna get rid of them. Uh, But in the midst of that, we see Jesus' use of the law, and it's really, really fascinating what he does. Matthew 19, 16, uh, this is what happens. It says, and behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? In other words, here, where's the yardstick? What do I gotta do to cross over? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what's good? There's only one who's good, and if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And now check out what Jesus says. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he mentioned six. The first five were part of the 10. The sixth one was part of the 613. So Jesus cites it all together. He doesn't just cite, uh, you know, the 10 commandments as kind of this ultra special part. He's like, no, this is all one cohesive thought pattern that began with God to Moses for his people. What I'm getting at is you can't separate the 10 commandments 
from the rest of the law. And so the Ten Commandments are part of a system and a structure that Jesus fulfilled that we aren't bound by. Now, some of you are panicking right now. <laughs> You're like, Pastor Kyle is saying the Ten Commandments don't apply. Our whole Christian structure of obedience is gonna fall apart. What are we gonna do? Hold your horses. I'll explain, okay? See, at the cross, Jesus inaugurated an entirely new covenant. Let me unpack this a little bit for you further. Turn to the book of Hebrews chapter eight, verse 13, and this is what it says. It says, in speaking of a new covenant, he being Jesus, makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, it says the new covenant made the old one obsolete. Now, if you think making them obsolete means that we can relax a bit, we we should all think Again, if anything, I would argue to us today that Jesus increases the requirements of the law. Now, jump back to Matthew, and in this time, go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, and we're going to see how Jesus increased the requirements of the law. This is what happened. Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these command, commandments and teaches others, not to, or teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so now everyone is confused at this point in the message. Jesus said he didn't come to abolish it, he came to fulfill it. Hebrews tells us that the old covenant is obsolete. So which one is it? Is it obsolete or does it apply? Well, Let me answer that with the next section that says two things that every Christian needs to know about the law as a whole. And the first thing I want you to write down in there is that Jesus fulfilled it, he didn't abolish it, but he fulfilled it by revealing its deeper meaning. And I'm gonna go on here in in just a little bit and read more parts of it where Jesus unpacks the deeper meaning uh, of the commandments. But to anyone who would say, oh, all that Old Testament stuff just doesn't apply anymore now because of Jesus, you have not read Jesus or the New Testament. See, Jesus increased the moral responsibility of the law just about every single time. And we'll see that Jesus reinterpreted some aspects of the law and some he does just straight out remove. But let me check out, or let us all check out today what what he said in verse 20. Uh, This is what Jesus said. Uh, He says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when he would say that our righteousness or the righteousness of the people then needed to exceed that of the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, everyone would hearing that would be like, oh man, that's impossible. Again, I don't measure up. Because when we hear it today, we think, oh, Pharisees, bad guy, negative connotation. But back in that day, the Pharisees were the most moral and upstanding people in the culture that they knew. And nobody was more righteous than they were. And so here we see Jesus was upping the requirements. He goes, you know, the people that you think are the most moral and upstanding in all of society, your righteousness needs to exceed theirs. Then he goes on in verses 21 and 22. He increases the requirement of the law again. He says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, a lot of people probably would have read that commandment, do not murder, I hope, and been like, I'm good. (laughs) And Jesus is like, hey, if you've ever had inappropriate anger in your heart towards somebody else, it's just as bad as if you murdered them. Uh, And then in verses 27 through 28, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, some people might think it's a badge of pride that they haven't committed adultery in the official sense of the word. And Jesus says that if we've ever had lustful thoughts towards someone that's not our spouse, that it's the same as if we've committed the act of adultery itself. So for Jesus, fulfilling the law meant showing its true meaning and deepening its requirements in just about every sense. And now the most terrifying verse to everyone who was sitting hearing the Sermon on the Mount and even to us today would come from Matthew 5, 48. And this is what Jesus told the crowd. He said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. (laughs) 
Now, if I'm sitting in there and I'm hearing that sermon, I'm like, I'm doomed. I I don't know what to do. What do I make of Jesus' words? And this is the moment in the message where everybody freaked out then and where we should still be freaking out today. So what does this mean for us? Well, here's my theologically profound illustration that I have for you. And this is a new one. This isn't the old one, okay? The I don't know. I've got a sense of what this one means. And and here's what it is. We're all screwed. (laughs) That's Jesus' whole point. No one measures up. We're not going to get in. Only he can ever live up to this standard of righteousness. And remember, you know, that ride yardstick illustration, the whole point of it is to say we can't get in without a righteousness that's not our own. And so in this sense, we see how the law was incomplete. And its entire purpose was to point us to Christ, the one person who fulfilled it and was able to do that. Uh, No one has ever been able to to keep God's commandments perfectly other than Jesus. And so we're supposed to look at them and say, I'm not worthy. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of all these things that we've been reading about the 10 commandments, that only Jesus has ever been the one who fulfilled them in in their initial sense and in their current sense for what it means for us today. Now, there's a a, a verse that comes in Revelation 5. It's a picture of heaven, and I want to just go ahead and read it to you, because here we see there's uh, God, Jesus sitting on the throne, and there's the elders around him, and uh, this little moment happens. I want to have you read. So Revelation 5, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start at verse 7. It says, and he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. So in this whole picture in heaven, everyone is, there's this scroll and and no one can open it. And all of a sudden there's one who's worthy. It's the lamb. And the lamb who's reigning on the throne is the one who makes his king, his people, a kingdom of priests. Now let me drive this point home. Just one more verse in here. And it comes to us from the book of Hebrews. I'm sorry, the book of James chapter two verses 10 and 11, and in James 2, 10 and 11, it says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, that's an interesting scenario, but okay, Um, (laughs) you have become a transgressor of the law. See, the only point is this. If you sin in one aspect of the law, you've broken all of it. That's the whole point. Only Jesus is able to open the scroll. Only Jesus is able to save us. And so what aspects of the law apply to us today and which ones don't. Before I answer that, let me just say that it's a little bit dicey in my opinion to pick apart the law and say this one applies and and this one doesn't. Uh, But clearly there is some level of interpretation that's involved because Jesus did inaugurate a new covenant uh, for Christians and so there's some deciphering that we do have to do. Uh, But the fact is this, I think that this next statement that I'm gonna give you is what counts for Christians today. And this is it. And the second thing we need to know about the law. If Jesus or the New Testament reaffirm or reinterpret it, we're called to follow it. Otherwise, we're no longer bound by it. See, the Jewish law, it revealed certain aspects of God's heart that we can learn from. I believe it can still speak to us today in many different ways, but the Jewish law that is not reaffirmed by Jesus or the New Testament is part of a past covenant that Jesus rendered obsolete at the cross. They were designed for the Jewish nation as a people, for the Jewish temple as a a construct, and neither of those systems are relevant anymore. In John 19.30, I mentioned it last Last week, Jesus' last three words were, it is finished. And so as the 
proper second Adam. He came and lived successfully where Adam failed without sin and without failure. Um, And he was the only one who could die as a substitute for our sins on the cross because of that. And then in Matthew 27, verses 50 through 51, it tells us that the moment that Jesus died on the cross, that the curtain in the the Holy of Holies, it, it was torn in two from top to bottom and it ripped open. And so it was this way of God saying, there's no more separation between the holy and the unholy. You can go boldly before the throne of God with grace. In Galatians 3.24, it tells us that the law was our guardian until Christ came. Romans 6.14 says that sin doesn't have dominion of us, uh, over us since we are no longer under the law, but under grace. Now, the, fir- the Ten Commandments section is just one of 613 commands that God gave to Moses. Yes, they're important. They're the first ten uh, and, and arguably the ones that we think about the most today. But the whole thing would have been a part of the law, the system that Jesus fulfilled. Now, over the years, I've heard some pastors try to say that the moral laws of the the law of Moses apply, like the Ten Commandments, but that the civil and the ceremonial laws don't. Now, I get what that statement is getting at, for, uh, and, and the point of it is really just that those are the things that are often carried over in the New Testament, but the bigger point is that we're no longer bound by the law at all because we're under the new covenant. And here's the problem with that definition. The law doesn't divide itself into those categories. You know, every Jew would have just called the whole thing the law, both then and today, they would say the same thing. So instead, the question we should ask ourselves is which aspects of the Jewish law are are reaffirmed, uh, reinterpreted, or removed entirely in the New Testament. Many practices in the Old Testament are reaffirmed in the New Testament. Uh, we see this with the case of obedience. We see this with the case of things like giving uh, and, and tithing. We see this uh, with how worship was supposed to be individually then, but also corporately then. Uh, we also see how new dimensions get added to this reality, um, like the fact that we're no longer, we don't have to go to a temple to meet God, we go to church, but now we're the temple. We, the people, are the church, and we are the building of God. And so we bring his presence and his holiness wherever we go. So you see how it takes on a new layer that it didn't have before. Acts 11, 1 through 18 is an example of where something just gets removed and reinterpreted entirely. So what happens is God tells Peter, bacon, eat now. Bacon, eat now. Some of you guys are getting hungry right now. Bacon, eat now. That's the Pastor Kyle translation of the Bible for you right there. I said it three times on purpose because that's how many times God had to tell it to Peter in the story, if you know. And I kid, obviously, that's not exactly how it goes down. But what God tells Peter is that it was officially okay to eat meats that were considered unclean to the Jews. And Peter insists, he's like, God, I've never eaten anything unclean in my entire life and I don't plan on doing it now. And so Peter has this same dream three times until he realizes, yes, this was indeed from God. Now, a little bit of a sidebar here for us all to think about, uh, but Peter had to go through several things three times to, in, in his life. He denied the Lord three times, didn't he? Uh, he had to have uh, be reaffirmed by the Lord three times before he was recommitted to ministry. And here, before he took this as a statement from God, he had to get the dream three times. And I just see an interesting parallel with myself that change often comes stubbornly even in my own life. But back to the point, you know, the Old Testament eating laws were clearly reinterpreted entirely in Acts 11 and elsewhere in the New Testament. So we always go with the standard of the New Testament uh, as, as what we should follow as Christians. And it's still helpful to know and to study why God had the people do what they did back then. Uh, but really, if it, what matters for you and I today is whether Jesus reinterpreted it, he reaffirmed it, or whether he removed it entirely. And the practice of the Sabbath is kind of this one that is a mix of reinterpret and uh, reaffirmed. Uh, and, and I already mentioned that it's the only one of the Ten Commandments that's not restated in the New Testament, and that's because Jesus reinterprets it. And Jesus, in the er- example of the early church, reinterpreted it. He invites us to come to him for our spiritual rest in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. And it's reinterpreted in the sense that it's less about the day. 
And it's more about that practice of regular biblical rest as a pattern in all of our lives. And we also see uh, that Jesus makes a distinction when he's talking about the Sabbath, that it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. That was a new distinction uh, that he made. And so Jesus would heal people on the Sabbath. And, and then the Pharisees would get upset at him. And he would say, well, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So he told them he had dominion over it. And that's how it worked. So we're no longer bound by the Jewish law. And in terms of the 10 commandments, nine out of 10 of them are reaffirmed. And the one that's not is clearly reinterpreted by the Lord. So yes, they apply to the Christian. I am not denying that reality. And the one that isn't restated clearly uh, is something that Jesus wants in all of our lives, that principle of rest. See, their fulfilled form is an even higher requirement that pointed to the fact that only Christ could ever truly fulfill it. And so that which is reaffirmed or reinterpreted in the New Testament always takes precedence. But, you know, if we always want to just boil it down because I love how God often does that. Uh, Jesus pretty much did that in Matthew chapter 22. And so if you got a Bible, go ahead and turn there. Verses 34 through 40. Jesus said this, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. And so Jesus made it super simple. He said, love God, love people. That's the last thing there. And you know, really, uh, you've heard it said before, And it's been said for thousands of years and it'll continue to be said for thousands and thousands of more years because that's how God has always boiled down the truest meaning of his law. Now we absolutely can and we should get into the nitty gritty of what does it mean to love God in my family? What does it mean to love God when I'm at church? What does it mean to love God when I'm not at church? What does it mean to love God when I'm on vacation? What does it mean to love God with my finances? What does it mean to love God with my sexual life? What does it mean to love God with my friendships? What does it mean to love people when I don't feel like loving people? What does it feel like, uh, what, what, what does it mean to love God when, when they hurt me? What does it lo- mean to love people when people really, really hurt me? What does it mean to love God and to love people? And just like the Ten Commandments when they were first stated didn't spell out how to love God in every conceivable situation, you know what? Neither does Jesus. We have to wrestle with the word. We have to wrestle with our situation that we're dealing with. And we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to love God in here? What does it mean to love people in here, right here and right now? And remember, the 10 commandments were not just a list of do's and don'ts. They were God's wedding vows to his people. They were God's commitment and unpacking of what relationship was supposed to look like then. And they continue to be a guiding light in terms of what relationship with God looks like today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being so clear with us about what relationship is. And so right here and right now, Lord, we just come to you and and we ask God that if we have broken relationship with you, Lord, I pray for anyone who's just feeling like they're not connected to you right now. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring them into a reminder of what they need to do. God, restore the relationship. And Lord, if there are people in our lives that either have hurt us or uh, maybe we've hurt, if there's someone we've hurt, may we do what we need to do to make it right. And and if there's someone who's hurt us and we're holding on to some bitter root or some anger in there, uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to let it go so we can love you with a clear conscience and we can love people the way that you've designed us to. Lord, we thank you so much for the fact that you are a God who outlined how to be restored in relationship. May that happen today. In Jesus' name, amen.